please welcome Dr. Mark Levitt. Thank you, Professor Barlow. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. And one of the reasons it's such a pleasure to be here is uh, you now hold the record for the least amount of travel I've had to do to get to a speaking site. I live probably less than 10 miles away from here. Um, in the last few years, most of my talks have been in Washington, D.C. or Chicago or who knows where. So it's a joy to be back at home and be able to talk to you. And it's also really great uh, to have the chance to be in front of such a nice variety of people. Now, it's going to make the talk challenging, so I'll try to you know, avoid the jargon. But having spent the last um, half a dozen years working with Washington policy initiatives, Washington never met an acronym they didn't like. Um, so I'll try to explain them as I go. And I'll also look forward to your questions. I'll keep the talk to 30 minutes or less so that we have time for questions, because I think that's always the best part. That's my chance to learn from you. And um, I'm looking for some good ones. So today's topics. First of all, can federal incentives drive adoption? How many are familiar with the, um, the federal laws that have been passed that offer financial incentives for using health IT? Not necessarily everybody, so I won't, I won't assume that. So let's talk about these topics. Um, first, there's, there's kind of a historic and legendary disconnection between healthcare and information technology. Healthcare is the industry with the lowest adoption of IT and probably the highest need for IT. I just want to spend a few minutes trying to explain why that is the case. Why does the corner video store have more information technology than your doctor's office? Um, then I'm going to talk about the federal government's discovery of health IT as a possible silver bullet to solve our health care problems um, and trace the history of that because I've kind of been in the middle of it. As, as luck would have it, I ended up sort of being uh, around that for the past half dozen years. Um, and then this most recent bit of legislation, um, which was the Stimulus Act, which was passed, you'll recall, the end of 2009 and signed February of 2009. I'm sorry, passed the end of 2008, signed February 2009. That included, among its $800 billion in, in stimulus uh, monies, about 20 to 30 or more billion dollars in health IT incentives. We'll talk about that. And then we want to ask the, the key questions. Is this going to work? Can you drive IT adoption with money? Was that the only thing wrong? Is that we needed more money? And if we do get people to adopt health IT, will it pay off in improved quality, safety, and efficiency, which is why you want the IT, not just so that you have a lot of computers. OK. So let's talk about the first question, the disconnect. What is wrong with this picture? Let me describe a situation. The largest economic se sector in the United States, $2.5 trillion a year, a sector that's very knowledge and information based. It's really you know at the heart of, of what they do is applying knowledge, information about people, highly trained professionals, and coupling that knowledge. It's a knowledge industry. It's experienced unsustainable cost growth for decades, double and triple the rate of overall inflation. Um, there are huge quality, safety, and efficiency issues, well documented. Um, the Institute of Medicine estimated that we have 50 to 100,000 deaths every year from medical errors alone. So there's an error rate for you. Um, it has one of the lowest proportionate investments in IT of any industry. When I joked about the video store, I actually wasn't joking. The trucking industry spends more of its revenues on IT than healthcare. Um, and finally, a core process of care that still uses paper records. Now, I'm not sure if we go over to Tuality across the street, what we'll see. I myself practiced at St. Vincent Hospital, which is part of the Providence system. And they actually have adopted electronic records. But if, if we just randomize this and talk about going into a doctor's office or hospital anywhere around the country, I'm pretty confident when you walk in, you'll see paper records. And I'll talk about that. So why? Is it because electronic health records, and you'll see this abbreviation EHR for electronic health records. Is it because we don't know what the benefits are? No. The benefits are obvious. Better information means wiser decisions. If you can measure your performance, you can improve your performance. If you don't measure your performance, you're going to have a lot of trouble improving your quality. <clears throat> what about automated error checking? Do you know how many drugs a physician uh, has to know 
and how many new ones come on the market each year and how fast medical knowledge is growing every year. Somebody said like 60,000 pages a month of new medical knowledge. So automated error checking could improve safety. We could use alerts and reminders so that we know about preventive care. A very good study from a few years ago shows that only 50% of the time do patients get simple recommended preventive care that everyone agrees should happen, whether that's a simple screening or a vaccination. Um, and of course, we can reduce duplication. Something like 10 to 15% of our labs and x-rays are duplicated simply because we couldn't find the previous one easily. That would lower costs right there. And of course, once records are portable, if they were electronic and portable, patients get choice and you start to get competition between providers on, on quality, on, on service, on, and on price. And we could see improvements there. And finally, this isn't just communication with doctor to nurse, and nurse to doctor, and, and all of that. It's also about empowered patients. If patients start to see their information, interact with it, they could correct the errors. They could be empowered, and that might really change healthcare. So the, the benefits are there. Why haven't we done it? Well, a lot of barriers. Um, one of the biggest is the financial issue is that our current healthcare system pays for volume, not for quality. So it, it is as if um, we were in a piecework environment. The more patients you get through in a given day, the more money you make. You don't make more because you did an exceptional job on a patient, made no errors, uh, remembered all their preventive care, and they went home saying that was a great experience. They didn't make me wait. I got an appointment within a day. You know, none of that matters. It's just volume. So why do you need IT to improve quality and safety if you're only being paid for, for volume? And there's never been a reimbursement for IT. If you take the three letters MRI and you buy one for a million dollars, you'll start making a thousand dollars a pop for using it. Take the three letters EHR, buy one for a million dollars for your hospital, you won't get paid an extra penny. And you'll be paying to operate it year after year after year. So financial is a big one. There's technical issues. I mean. Laptop computers aren't ideal for clinicians walking around. Um, we don't really have the perfect platform yet, and even handheld devices aren't perfect. How do I hold a handheld while I'm listening to the stethoscope or, or operating on a patient? There's issues. And there are cultural issues. We're still training most of our doctors using paper records. I have a bumper sticker I, uh, I've been promoting, and actually a medical school has now adopted this slogan. Paper training, it's for puppies, not for doctors. <laughs> so I've got one medical school now somewhere. Um, there's also change management issues. If you trained on paper records and you're comfortable working with that and you're 45 years old and someone says change everything, you're going to type it in instead and you didn't learn to type because you're from the pre-internet generation, there's an issue there. And there's systemic issues. The liability climate. Well, electronic records are much more thorough. In fact, you could talk about video records. If you wanted to have simple, easy documentation, why sit and write and dictate? Just record your patient conferences, but we get the liability issue. Um, it makes EHRs a double-edged sword, because they can let people prove you didn't do something as well as it lets you prove you did do something. And then there's legal obstacles to hospitals and doctors collaborating. So as a result, adoption has been pretty dismal. Now, these figures are conservative because these definitions of electronic health records were pretty rigorous. But um, even so, to think about the fact that only about 12% of hospitals have a basic electronic records and about the same percentage of doctors' offices. And if you talk about a real comprehensive one that's doing all the error checking on drugs and the prescriptions automatically, makes sure that the right drug comes to the bedside for the patient, maybe there's a wristband and a barcode, you're talking about 2%. Same for doctor's offices, maybe 4%. So most likely when you walk in, you're going to see this. Um, what I was...